Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. My name is Rick Algendi. I'm a Ph.D. candidate in theology here at the Divinity School, and I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for this session. Myra Rivera Rivera is an associate professor of theology and Latina O studies at Harvard Divinity School. Her transdisciplinary work in critical theological studies engages key Christian themes in relation to current theory and philosophy, while also analyzing the role of religious ideas in Latina theory. Professor Rivera is the author of The Touch of Transcendence, A Postcolonial Theology of God, and is currently writing a book that explores the connections between theological and philosophical metaphors of body and flesh. Her paper is entitled Emptying God, The Ethics of Theology in Merleau-Ponty's Work. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rivera. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here and to be part of this conversation that has already given us so much to think about. There is a scientific and ideological language for what is happening to weather, but there are hardly any intimate words. Is this surprising? With these words, Zadie Smith begins her recent piece in the New York Review of Books, in which she reflects on what is being lost each and every day through global warming. Each country has its local sadness, she says. The outlook for her small island, Jamaica, is not very different from that of my own small island, is one of devastation, the loss of whole islands and peoples. To her surprise, she sees Christians trapped in cycles of guilt, shame, and apocalyptic doom. She wonders what would help us move from asking, what have we done, to asking, what can we do? And so she suggests we begin to find words and practices that help us sense the intimacy of the loss and move us to more sustainable forms of life. And isn't this our greatest challenge? The call of this conference invited us to offer accounts of God that are ethically relevant for the contemporary world. Before their request, however, the organizers reminded us of a tension that will unavoidably affect such a project. If beliefs about God are open to moral critique, then what is the status of moral codes, even of calls of social justice? that are underwritten and presumably given authority by claims about God. In response to this invitation to offer a relevant account of God, I promise to talk about emptying God, and to do so in dialogue with Maurice Marleau-Ponty, a philosopher, not a theologian, who wrestles with the ethical failures of Christianity in the face of the Holocaust and other atrocities of the 20th century. So right there, you should have been suspicious. It was only when I sat down to write this lecture that I became conscious of an apparent ambiguity in my choice, at least the choice of the title, to think about the ethics of theology from a position that does not consider itself either in ethics or theology. So let me explain. There is considerable debate about Marlo Ponti's theological commitments. It seems to me that philosophers who reject his position 
are prompt to accuse him of espousing Christianity, while those who claim him tend to downplay the role of Christianity in his thought. As I see it, he's, he actually stands somewhere in the middle. He refused to equate faith with good faith. But it is very difficult to imagine the emergence of his philosophy of flesh if one doesn't take into account Christian theology. And I'll unpack this argument shortly. But there is more to my choice of dialoguing with Marlo Ponti for reasons that are not only a matter of choice in the past, I have addressed the question of the relationship between ethics and theology in dialogue with Emmanuel Levinas and the reception of his work in Latin American liberation theology. I continue to return to Levinas' interpretation of the third commandment, you shall not make wrongful use of the name of God as an ethical prohibition. You shall never name God except from a position of ethical responsibility. This remains a crucial principle for me. However, recently I have sought the company of Marlo Ponti rather than Levinas in search for a more broadly material framework for envisioning positions of ethical responsibility. In other words, to help us understand terms such as ethics, politics, ideology, and the like, as pointing to material forces that shape our bodies as well as the non-human world. To be sure, the interest in materiality was already part of liberation thought in the 1970s. Thinkers like Enrique Dussel recognize that an ethics of liberation required theologies that moved beyond spirit matter or soul body dualisms, which would separate religious pursuits from social commitments. The aim was not to privilege the social over the theological, but rather to return theology, Christian theology, to the teachings of Jesus which emphasize the material elements of life, healing the sick, feeding the poor, protecting the stranger. I rehearse this well-known history because the tendency to equate talk of material concerns with discussions of social class may lead us to forget the embodied dimensions of liberation. And more importantly, because these concerns with food, water, health, and protection lead me today to think about materiality more broadly. Although they follow very different paths, the focus on embodied life converge with feminist commitments. The work of Pamela Sue Anderson articulates this orientation for feminist philosophy of religion as, quote, striving for a joyful continuation of bodily existence and indeed of bodily relations. I'm interested in ways of thinking about ethical discourses and practices as material phenomena. I have found Marlo Ponti's work valuable for this purpose. His work starts from observations about the political consequences of separating the realm of ideas and values from the material, and moves from there to phenomenological explorations, and finally, to a critical and constructive engagement with prevalent understandings of being and knowledge of ontology and epistemology. These philosophical discussions concern Christian theology both because theology has often assumed the very positions that Marlowe Ponty is criticizing, but also because it has resources that resist them. For Marlowe Ponty, this was the implication of the incarnation, understood as the emptying of God in the flesh of the earth. 
In this lecture, I trace the move that links ethics and epistemology to a philosophy of flesh. And it serves really as an example uh, more, more than a, a broader framework, an, an example of where ethics, philosophy, and epistemology meet around the topic of the incarnation. So on Christian ethics. Beginning with his early writings in the 1930s, Marleau-Ponty took to task Christian teachings that seemed to undermine Christianity's commitment to social justice. He defended Christianity against charges that it could foster an impoverished life, but he also challenged Christianity. He noted, for instance, how the devaluation of works in the doctrine of justification by faith could foster a preoccupation with the relation between each soul and its God, and thus a turn toward the self. From there, Marlo Ponti writes, one is easily led to abandon loves of one's neighbor and invest the moral functioning of society with all authority. He concedes that there is perhaps not a necessary sequence here, but the abandonment of responsibility toward society appeared to be a historical fact. The link between the idea of an inner self and the orientation away from social responsibility that he had merely identified before, he explored more, more robustly in his 1946 essay, Faith and Good Faith. And the date is extremely important for the development of his work, this is 1946 France. The essay opens by lambasting Catholicism as an institution for its, for its inconsistent stance in relation to social problems. Marleau-Ponty is not content, however, to locate the problem solely in the contingencies of institutional history, to regard the failures of the church as accidental. Instead, he contends, there must be an ambiguity in Catholicism as a spiritual way of life to correspond to its ambiguity as a social phenomenon. The source of the ambiguity, he suggests, is nothing less than an inconsistent view of God. Christianity holds on to a belief in both an interior and an exterior God. The interior God dwells in the inner man. Marleau-Ponty traces this interior God to the inner man, uh, in the inner man to Augustine, and thus the resonances with Luther's teaching, which he had criticized before, are not accidental. There are important differences, to be sure, between Augustine's fallen soul and the autonomous self of modernity of course, but Marleau-Ponty worried that the belief in an inner God implies that one seeks God by turning away from things, and it's this turn to interiority that he's really interrogating. Whether God is the model according to which my spirit was created, or whether I experience and, so to speak, touch God, when I become conscious of myself as spirit, God is, in any case, on the side of the subject rather than on the side of the world, he says. Marleau Ponty is referring to Christian notions of imago Dei and the spiritual senses, respectively, but his main concern is with the general tendency to imagine interiority as the site of immediacy. The assumption of an immediate connection between the self and a God imagined as clarity and light ultimately makes God un indistinguishable from the interior self where it is found and which it founds. In this model, one is obedient to God 
by assenting to the subject's will, and this makes faith necessarily good faith. While this God is conceived as immediately accessible to the individual who turns inward, it is detached from and unaffected by the world in general. This God is always already complete and absolute, he contends. No human action or worldly strife would affect this God's perfection. Having absolute knowledge of everything from the beginning, this God effects, in effect reduces things and persons to objects. But the incarnation changes everything. In the incarnation, God is externalized, Marlo Ponti suggests. This event marks a transition from the reign of the Father through the incarnation to the reign of the Spirit. This is a familiar interpretation of the incarnation for which um, Marlo Ponti depends on Hegel. But he thinks this account still requires much more consideration. The transformation brought about by the incarnation is a divine emptying without reserve. He says, God is no longer in heaven, but in human society and communication. God's appearance in the world thus means that the search for God shall not be directed toward the heavens, but reoriented toward the world. Yet the change is more than a spatial shift. The nature of God and the way of seeking God also needs to be rethought. So knowledge of God. This exterior God, the God of the incarnation, is not a self-contained perfection outside of or unmoved by the world, God is in the world, but this mode of presence does not imply immediacy to the self, as it is in the case of the interior God that he's criticizing. Indeed, neither presence nor absence seem to be appropriate terms to talk about the knowledge of an incarnate God. Instead, it is a matter of pondering how one encounters God in the flesh, for which he, we need to be guided by our experience and knowledge of the sensible world. Indeed, Christians claim that the incarnate God was seen and left words and memories in the sensible world. But no knowledge of the sensible world is ever absolute, unmediated, or devoid of mystery. In the incarnation, then, the divine mystery is not an effect of distance or separation, but rather of God becoming flesh. The task of human beings is thus, and I quote, entering body and soul into an enigmatic life, the obscurities of which cannot be dissipated. Entering into that life means acknowledging that our complete being is caught in, is part of that very world. All knowledge of the world is relational. Christian teaching entails commentary and interpretation. Hence, he argues, the paradigmatic genre of the Gospels is the parable. Placing faith in the midst of the sensible life, which is always enigmatic, entails admitting that faith is not certainty, that faith cannot be assumed to be necessarily good faith. This is not to dismiss faith, however, but rather to integrate it into all areas of life and knowledge. Quote, faith in the sense of an unreserved commitment, which is never completely justified, 
enters the picture as soon as we leave the realm of pure geometrical ideas and have to deal with the existing world, end quote. This implies that all commitments are subject to revision and critique. For Marleau-Ponty, this principle is at the heart of Christianity expressed in the commandment against idolatry. Like Levinas, Marleau-Ponty relates the religious obligation with ethical responsibility. He argues that a saint negates a God who would be the only warrantor of the natural order, who would consecrate not only the world's goodness, but the world's evil as well, who would justify slavery, injustice, the tears of children, and the agony of the innocent. Like the saint, the philosopher has a duty to to a critique of idolatry. Thus he proposes a negative philosophy model after a negative theology. In the political realm, this entails a critique of false structures, those structures that obstruct a being's relationship with the world to which she belongs. It, is all, it also entails the critique of false ideas. And here the judgment requires attention to the sensible world. For example, the idea of liberty, he says, becomes false as soon as it becomes only an idea. And we begin, you, we begin to defend liberty instead of free people. The negation is not a turn to nothingness, though. Negation is only the beginning of attention and a seriousness toward the world. Thus, perceptual faith implies also affirmation. Each of our perceptions is an act of faith in that it affirms more than we strictly know. Since objects are inexhaustible and our information is limited. Each of our daily acts of relating in the world entails a commitment to what can never be fully justified. That affirmation is crucial for commitments to social justice, for it takes its place in the real and in the belief that we do inhabit the same world, despite the limits of our situated knowledges. Marleau-Ponty concludes that Christianity does not follow the incarnation in all its consequences. Christianity is satisfied neither with an exterior nor an interior God, moving inconsistently between the two. And here lies a source of its ambiguous political positions. Quote, when it remains true to the incarnation, it can be revolutionary, but the religion of the father is conservative. Marleau-Ponty's argument is not simply about philosophical coherence, however. The ethical stakes are high because Christianity continues to cling to an infinite knowledge that has already settled everything, its central teaching is undermined. Quote, love changes into cruelty, the reconciliation of humans with each other and with the world will come to naught. Ultimately, the incarnation turns into suffering because it is incomplete, end quote. And the incompletion here stems from Christian attachment to the religion of the Father, its insistence in looking for God in the heavens rather than on earth. And again, I'm using the religion of the Father in the Hegelian sense. This manifests in its social commitments. God will never fully come to earth, 
Merleau-Ponty states, unexpectedly adopting a rather prophetic tone, until the church feels the same obligation toward other humans as it does toward its own ministers, toward the houses of Guernica as toward its own temples, end quote. So here you see that the incarnation is more than God's self-emptying action. It denotes also a possibility yet to be realized in the world, a self-emptying of Christianity toward the world. It is as if it were necessary for God to become incarnate, for human beings to understand who they are, to help human beings live, as if a carnal God were needed for human beings to consent to being flesh. This could be a commentary on the Church Fathers, but it is a scholar's appraisal of the implications of Marlo-Ponty's work. Marlo-Ponty's reading of the Incarnation as a complete emptying of God pushes against the limit of authoritative Christian interpretations, and indeed against the limits of Christianity itself as an institution. But he is in good company in seeing the incarnation as more than a description of God's move toward the world as a prescription for human life. It is not that Christians may decide to privilege the world but that the Christian God has done so. The incarnation, and also that the incarnation requires Christians to do likewise, to give themselves to the world. Marlo Ponti's 1946 essay ends with little assurance that the most significant implications of the incarnation will ever be embraced. Yet flesh becomes the central concept in Marlo-Ponty's later work. And it is significant to hear in his philosophy of flesh, where God is not named, at least not often, um, to hear in it echoes of the Gospel of John, of the word becoming flesh. Marlo-Ponty's ontological work unfolds as an exploration of flesh. In contrast with common associations of flesh with a matter contained within bodies, in Marlo-Ponty's relational ontology, flesh is an element that weaves together all things. Flesh twists and turns, constituting realities that never exhausted. Flesh is relationship, the interweaving between bodies and things in the world. It is that which traverses and constitutes us materially. There is a flesh of things, but it is not a thing contained within bodies, not even properly a thing. And he had previously argued that the incarnation troubled that distinction between the interiority and the exteriority. It connects, flesh connects the perceiving body to the thing perceived. Flesh makes possible the communication between the seeing and the sensed, a separation that joins. But the relationship it mediates is never between two self-identical constituted things that then encounter each other. Flesh is constitutive of my body and of the world, yet it does not belong to me and it does not belong to you. It is an element like water or air on which we all depend and to which we all contribute. Through our bodies, we are in touch with the flesh of the world. We are of it, but we can never fully explain it. The mystery is never expelled. The experience of connection between our bodies, we experience that connection between our bodies and other bodies, and we have faith 
that we inhabit the same world. But the hinge between my touch and your touch remains irremediably hidden from me. In this ontology of flesh, I do not see the world from the outside. I am not a cosmotheorist, as he puts it. Instead, all my seeing and all my knowledge are shaped by and contribute to the flesh of the world for good and for ill. Flesh highlights the materiality of all relations while pushing against the tendency to relate to reduce materiality to inert substance, fully graspable and controllable. That is, that it is all gathered under the term flesh rather than matter is significant. The flesh is not matter, is not mind, is not substance, he writes. Envisioning flesh as an element averts the dualisms that sneak in whenever terms such as matter, mind, spirit, and substance are used. Modern dualisms predispose us to associate matter with passivity and recalcitrance. And in such depictions, flesh tends to assume similar traits as a passive, death-prone aspect of corporeality. An elemental poetics of flesh seeks to disrupt, disrupt these tendencies. And I am suggesting that the term may also remind us of Christian traditions where flesh is irreducibly material and yet capable vulnerable, and glorious. Whether or not one is moved by theism, one may find inspiration in, Christ, in a Christian vision where flesh names the, what the divine became, the same flesh that is said to be earth and grass and bread. What is flesh but many forms of earth Tertullian said. And the same tradition that inspired Tertullian still guides some of us, including the work of William Schweiker to elaborate on the ethical significance of the image of human beings as dust that breathes. And I'm trying to elaborate uh, more concretely what that image of the dust uh, can name for us. So naming God. I now return to the questions with which I started, a little differently and a little less linearly. I am suggesting that an account of an incarnate God implies consenting to being flesh in ways that make our ethical and religious responsibilities inextricable from each other. And again, I'm working within the Christian framework of the incarnation here. I could also say, conversely, that for Christians, naming God from a place of ethical responsibility implies attending to traditions that highlight human connections to earth as to flesh. And theology d does have a unique and crucial role to play in responding to this ethical call from the earth, whether it recognizes it or not. It can call religious people to moral responsibility, of course, but I use the term morality cautiously to avoid its associations with the view of an inner self essentially independent from the world the view that I have been problematizing here, to avoid reducing it to judgment, to the very question, what have we done? Consent to being flesh implies constitutive relationships where we do not simply look from the outside and prescribe a response, but rather understand our seeing, saying, and acting as part of that very flesh of its vulnerability and its potential glory. 
Other disciplines give us information about the functioning of the cosmos, the problems facing the planet, and the technical measures that could be taken to mitigate the problems. Theology offers visions of the world and visions of our own beings. Theology can help us to understand ourselves as related to God precisely by being flesh and help us sen sense the loss of earthy life as intimate loss and move us to other forms of life, the very questions that Zadie Smith was posing. This entails a faith that is not simply assumed to be good faith, a matter of goodwill or of good principles, but rather one that expresses itself as a commitment to a love of earth that requires knowledge, labor, criticism, and presence. This required theological words that lead us to attend to water, earth, the air, for words emerge from flesh and will also become flesh. This requires seeing each of our practices as our participation in the flesh of the world. Through these practices, we investigate and respond from within to the question, what can we do? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rivera, for that timely and very interesting paper, which to my mind impressively conveys the urgency of our identification with the world through the flesh without sacrificing a depth of engagement with a range of theological issues. In what follows, I'd like to set the table for our further discussion uh, of your paper with some brief reflections. To empty God on this view is to criticize the religion of the Father, undergirded by a theology in which transcendence comes from distance or separation. Making that criticism in the name of the mystery of the incarnation, God's canonic identification with the world in the word made flesh. In this way, God's self-emptying redirects our gaze toward the world and empties the idol of the God in heaven of its normative weight. The flight to interiority through which we would escape the world in order to commune with the divine is therefore not only suspect on the grounds of its ethical results, though certainly those, but also because after the incarnation, it represents a turning away of one's gaze from where God truly is. It seems to me that Merleau-Ponty, as you have presented him here, is perhaps one-sided in his interpretation of Augustine on this point. Augustine famously held that God is not only within what is deepest in me, but also higher than what is highest, and thus externalized in an equally real sense. However, I take it that Merleau-Ponty's argument, and even more clearly yours, is not about the interpretation of Augustine, so much as the identification of God with the flesh and the reconstitution this represents of our role and responsibility in the economy of grace. I should also register in passing a worry that some of us, including you, I'm sure, are likely to have that even though this is a critique of forms of Christian theology, the rhetoric of the religion of the Father seems potentially able to fund various supersessionisms. Uh, you rightly remind us that you're using this in its Hegelian sense. I'm not sure if that makes the problem better or worse. However, I trust that the ways that you have laid out the theology represented here, especially in identifying God within rather than beyond the world, and the positions of responsibility we must inhabit to speak of that God, would give us ample resources to resist those. Uh, the ethical payoff and the part of your move that I find most interesting takes root in the fact that one is left pondering how one encounters God in the flesh, for which we need to be guided by our experience and knowledge of the sensible world which experience and knowledge are enigmatic and uncertain. As you point out, the fact that this God cannot be spoken of as either clearly present or clearly absent engenders a negative philosophy modeled after familiar forms of negative theology. This has potent results, a critique of false structures and ideas underwritten by serious attention to the world. 
It also entails, though, an affirmation, crucial, for example, to commitments for social justice, for we must affirm more than we strictly know, and that affirmation entails a commitment to the world we all inhabit. On this view, we have no guarantees that our faith is, as you say, good faith, only the call to courage implied in staking our lives on situated knowledge and decisions about our world. Here is where I wonder if Merleau-Ponty's negative philosophy, at least as I'm familiar with it, has fully explored its own commitments, and whether that poses a challenge to your ethical concern for the fate of the natural world. Specifically, it seems to me that negative theology and philosophy are dangerous allies with respect to specific and foreordained ethical outcomes, since they entail not only a critique of the false, but a destabilizing of the true. Once admitted, the conviction that God, the center of value, is basically elusive, enigmatic, and present only in a mode which also doesn't exclude absence, seems to call into question not only unjust structures and ideologies, but our very conception of justice itself. That is, a truly negative philosophy or theology would also be reflexively negative, given to thoroughgoing self-critique, and in a way that seems inhospitable to a guaranteed conclusion, ethical or otherwise. Though, of course, one can still hold to ethical commitments while using techniques of negative theology and philosophy, those ethical commitments themselves become newly questionable. However these implications play out in Merleau-Ponty, you are obviously aware of them. You say quite plainly that all commitments are subject to revision and critique. But I would be interested to hear just how you integrate this negative theological or philosophical impulse into a larger account of responsibility while taking into account also its full critical power. By no means would this entail a failure of your argument through divine and human identification with the flesh to a simultaneously ethical and religious attention to the world, but perhaps it complicates its more linear character. When we seek to attend, quote, to traditions that highlight human connections to the earth as flesh, end quote, do we know in advance how such a God will judge our efforts? Have we grasped God by attending to the flesh, or are we in the process of being grasped by God, and isn't there a kind of epistemic and ethical reserve that comes with the latter? If so, then how does that reserve coexist with the real ethical urgency of, for example, care for creation? Notwithstanding that potential complication, however, I think you've accomplished something quite meaningful in this paper by giving us one form of imaginatively investing the world with the ethical urgency that theology can provide. As I was listening to your paper, it also occurred to me that that ethical urgency would be a good topic for you to expand on. Um, Specifically, if theology is to empty itself so as to identify God entirely with the world, from whence will we get theology's critical power. You've already talked in your conclusion a little bit about um, how it can spur religious people to moral responsibility, how it can give us visions of the world, but perhaps you could also expand on a critical theology's critical power, where it would come from without the kinds of transcendence that you're criticizing. With that, I'd like to open our conversation to you all after we hear from Professor Rivera. Let me let me clarify, um, and these are great questions. Thank you very much. Um, it, in, in, let me clarify that my, my references to the to Marlo Ponti's um, adoption of the Hegelian language is uh, my attempt to trace the trajectory. Where does Marlo Ponti gets all this uh, idea about what Christianity, um, rep- how Christianity represents the incarnation? Um, so I'm trying to show that his sources are, are rather mixed, including Catholic philosophers, um, but, but also reading it through Hegel, in that imposes its own limits to, to his own thought. I, um, so, so rather than, than being interested in, in affirming, I'm trying to show where, he, where, he, where he's coming from. Um, and, and thus uh, also... S- mark his own positionality in relation to Christianity with, with some caution. Um, 
the the question of of the of the position of of theology in relation so so does theology lose is uh, critical the possibility of a critical position if it's um, submerged or absolutely identified with the world i i I would share that commitment and and I think that what I'm trying to do both with the notion of transcendence and with the notion of of flesh is is to to try to question the idea that the only possibility of uh, norms of the emergence of norms and commitments is by imagining them as arising outside of relations. Um, so uh, I've previously worked on the notion of, of transcendence, precisely trying to both affirm the notion of, of divine transcendence and to um, open ways of thinking about it without having to have the implication that those ne- that transcendence necessarily implies outside of the world as we know it. Um, I'm, I'm not denying it either. Um, 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 I think in, in this, I, 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 uh, I take a similar position as Stryker was explaining right before of trying to begin with an account of ourselves as, human, as, as finite beings. Um, and our knowledge is, is knowledge produced by, by finite beings in that sense. Of 
the of how so, society and history has and continues to limit the access of bodies to the world in very specific ways. Right? So, so in the work I'm, I'm doing, that's the that's the next phase. Um, to, to think about how the organization of society would limit or not or um, limits access or limits our engagements and our possibilities of being constituted um, in relation to the world. Nonetheless, the attempt to think about these social structures as, as having material effects that are constitutive of our bodies and of our knowing is, is the part that I'm trying to, to highlight. When you say incarnation, are you speaking as a theological or are you using the word metaphorically? Um, I, the, the term I would use um, is poetically. And, and what I'm trying to signal with this is that there is a particular affected charge to the term um, that I that I am trying to unpack, and, and in this case through the through the through the legacy of the Christian tradition. And and it's not only a positive <coughs> charge; it's, all, it's, it's also in many ways a negative. So, so the, the concept of, of flesh, even though it is treated in, in philosophy as a, a philosophical concept, I'm trying to retrace the steps to Christian thought and to unpack that affective element in it. Um, I think I'd like to hear a little bit more about the relationship between interiority and exteriority. Mm -hmm. Because it strikes me that you've got a certain kind of monadic interiority by the tail, which is a modernist problem of the sort. But the notion of interiority, which I think you were pointing to, Rick, it's not monadic. It's an, I mean, it's an embodied metaphor. And so interiority and exteriority are connected. And what populates the space of interiority are symbols like the heart, for example. So it strikes me that there might be a need for an interior space that's deep and wise in order to have a relationship to the flesh. And so I'm kind of wondering how you see the interrelation yeah. between those Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question too. The, certainly I'm not trying to get rid of, of, the, of the notion of, of an interior self, but rather to see it as constituted in relation to, to the external. Um, so, so that the, the two sides are are always connected and always become in relation to one another. So it's the isolated interiority that the the most interesting. But that's a very ancient thought. I mean, you're talking about the city soul analogy then, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm kind of just wondering if there's a difference between your view and something like that. How do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I'm not claiming that is that is a is a new idea. I I'm trying to think um, more. You know, and, and, and this is coming out of a, trying to expand on notions of body, um, and so, so so trying to think about bodies in re, as relational, which which is, is not new either. Um, but but to think about those that relationality in material terms, and perhaps I should say more about why 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 do I care about the the question of. Of, of relations being understood in material terms, and and my my real concern is how does one understand the the impact of things like I, I said I, ideologies, uh, policies, um, political tendencies. Um, how how do we get in, into the habit of the mind? that allow us to think about a legislative um, decision having an impact in the very body of someone, and perhaps for many generations. So I think the interiority, in fact, help us think about this uh, long-term effects of social um, engagements in 
in, in the body in ways that are both interior and external. Oh, great, thank you. Thank you for your paper. Um, I'm trying to read, you know, Merleau-Ponty different bits and pieces, um, and sometimes I think I, you know, grasp a concept and then it slips away. Um, so I have a couple of questions, but the, the first one is, what exactly is flesh? I mean, sometimes I thought flesh was <clears throat> prior to the individuation of bodies, mm -hmm. almost as if it was like an a priori given. Mm -hmm. So it's not what we think of as flesh. Um, and I've, I've also thought sometimes it might even be more like um, a philosopher speculating about what, about what the primary stuff is. Is it water? Is it air? You know, kind of going back to the pre Socratics. <coughs> so he, he gets this idea of flesh or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's that, is it then not prior to the individuation of not only bodies but persons? So I'm, not, I'm just wondering if, if at, at the flesh level we don't need relationships. Mm -hmm. The relationships come after. The flesh is something prior. I don't know. Well, to the to the first part of the question, I think there's uh, it's it seems to be both the the materiality of bodies, not only human bodies, yeah. um, but also the condition of possibility of the emergence of life. Yeah. And as the condition of possibility for the emergence of life, it it is materiality reconceived in, in its vitality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, so the the where where does where do social relationships come yeah. come into the question? And and this is this is not my um, but 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 my. If, if, we, if we take flesh to name the material conditions and possibility right? yeah. um, in ways that do not that are not opposed to concepts such as spirit, um, we we would need to also consider how our very practices um, affect the conditions of possibility of of the of, of life. Um, and and and, and in, in, in ways that scholars thinking about uh, how to how to rethink the, the reductionist understandings of materiality, uh, we we can begin to think about how practices. A, a very easy example is how practices <coughs> affect the environment that affects such as water that affect the possibilities of human life. Um, so, so I think the, the 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 category of of flesh in the way that he is connecting both the possibility, the condition of possibility, and the and the emergence of embodied life uh, would need to be uh, also uh, would need to be supplemented with with an account of social life, uh, which also has. The, the, the power to limit the, the, the possibilities of life. So, yeah, yeah, maybe. Can I just put it slightly different then? Mm -hmm. um, I know it's a bit strange, but I have sometimes thought that the French of this sort of period um, are into a form of mysticism. Um, and I'm just wondering if this flesh that sort of connects us prior to individuation isn't some form of a mysticism. And um, I, I say this partly because I've been looking at Beauvoir, and one of the ways in which, and obviously Beauvoir, I don't want to study classical together at school before so much on this is But one of the ways in which um, Simone de Beauvoir wants to champion a particular form of mysticism mm -hmm. is the mysticism that is involved with practical action. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it seems like rather than visions and voices, mm -hmm. it comes from um, something that emerges mm -hmm. you know, in a practical action. I just wondered if flesh 
might be part of the um, basis of a, a mysticism. I think it is, as long as, as it, I mean, it, I think it is an attempt to not separate mysticism or not separate questions of spirit from questions of embodied, embodied life. Yeah. Um, so, so in a way, it, it tries to hold them together. So, so the I think there there are um, claims that Marlowe Ponti is too mystical, um, and and the or or it is that he's his work is, is a kind of mysticism. And I don't I don't know. Um, I would just want to be careful not to separate yes, you know, as soon not to separate that from, from, from the materiality from which it emerges. Yeah. Well thank you for your emphasis uh, on the materiality, the liveliness and all these Life. But um, don't you think that we should also emphasize the finitude, the dead calmness, mm -hmm. and the sobering fact that all flesh and life has to live at the expense of our life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that the. And, and I actually think that the, 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 the concept of flesh might help us in as much as it, it, it has an implication of mortality or vulnerability. Yeah. Um, so, it, so I think that the that the that the challenge should be to be able to hold both things together, right? To to hold that vulnerability, that that finitude uh, that characterizes life, um, and and in an in interdependent way, right? Because it's it's not only the the mortality that affects an individual, but it, but but how we are in a that our very life, lives are supported by networks of, of relations. Um, so, so it's both individual and, and collective in that, in that sense. But, but I absolutely agree that this, this notion of affinitude and vulnerability are, are central to, to the project. Then the question 
Then the interesting co question comes, what, what does it mean to be alone? Um, and in part, part of what I'm trying to say is, yes, we are a body, but what does it mean to be a body implies um, the being, being constituted in, in social relations, um, in, in material ways.
question, right? The, the, how, how does one go about the daily implementation of decisions? Um, and, and what principles to be guided by? And, and I think that the, what you're pointing to with the example of human beings as predators is, is, is that a, a, a principle of protection of all life is we, we, we can apply it, we can live by it. Um, but, but there are forms of life, there are practices um, that, are, that are, that concentrate the possibilities of life in, in particular subjects, um, in particular areas, to the detriment of others. So I think that the, 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 the principle um, would have to be one that is based on a broader um, analysis of the relationships at stake. Um, so, so, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, it'd be easy to say, well, let's protect all life, um, that, that, that would not lead us very far. Um, but I think that there are many ways in which we, we know that, that our, our practices, particularly practices that blind us to the effects of our own um, lives in, in the world, in other people's, um, are, can, can be judged on the basis of a, of a broader understanding of flourishing, of creation. Uh, yes, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, um, I'll just maybe get your reflections on what I thought you were reflecting on. Um, I, 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 I thought you were linking Christology with soteriology by saying that uh, perhaps the mystery of certain parts of the Christian tradition is not the absence of God, but the mystery that God is present. Mm -hmm. activity 
uh, I think it, it, it is a notion of flesh that is imbued with vitality is, is, the, is the word I use. Um, it's not an opposite of spirit. Um, it's not an... Uh, it, and and those, the, the notion of, of mystery, um, or opacity, etc., that are running through it um, would prevent just from, from thinking of it as, as, as yet again an object, a, a controllable thing, um, predetermined, etc. Um, so so I, I, think, I think it is, your comment is, is uh, I would agree in, in terms of not reducing it to a material, to, to an empirical um, object um, that, that, that we can feel in our Thank you. Um, this is more a, a comment than a question. Th thank you for your lecture. Um, talking about predation, right? Human beings are predators. That I, I think is true, but it's also true we are being predated upon. Yeah? So, as the, uh, uh, an ethics of finitude, of, of embodiment of flesh, is, an, is by definition an ethics of finitude mm -hmm. scarcity more than any theology of spirit can, can be. There we can escape. In a theology of embodiment, we can't escape. So the question is not, to me, whether we eat. The question for, especially the ethical question, is what do we eat? And I think the theology of embodiment brings that out uh, very clearly. And the question is not whether we eat, but what do we choose? And I think that is the important question. Yeah, and that's, a, that's an excellent example where um, the, the, the political and the material and the corporeal in, intersect and the questions of justice become very complicated. This has been a great conversation. I think we should uh, thank Professor Rosario for her paper. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School. <laughs>